Hello and welcome back to Rares Gaming and the things you didn't know in Elden Ring series. Today I have some fantastic theories and mysteries that I haven't yet considered, such as the fingers and what they're made from, the origins of Melina and the true giants of the lands between, as well as some quick and useful game stuff. This episode is almost entirely based on comments and discussions that we've had throughout the series, so a big thank you to everyone who's got involved this time. I'm really pleased this series has somehow increased in this type of back and forth. It makes it very fun for me. But anyway, let's start today episode. We begin today's episode and first thing then here in the round table hole. Moritz Westner comes in in the comments of last video with a really interesting theory all to do with the fingers and perhaps what they're actually made from. It's easy to assume looking at them and you know logically based on what you've been told about them that they are a living entity that ultimately is made up of flesh right and you know when you look at it it kind of looks like it has like the palm kind of grooves on it and then you have the sort of scarring along the side where you would imagine some skin has been peeled. You can also find them around the world in different places. One of the most common places you're going to find fingers though is of course at the top of various divine towers or all around the lands between. There is a bunch of them and it's quite a specific spot at the top of a tower like this. Further, these models are actually different in a really notable way. We're gonna go back to the one at the round table again, but once again, I want you to really take a look at the detail of this specific finger and all of the fingers around at the top of the towers. I've now turned my volume up way high, so let's have a listen to what it sounds like when I run around on it. Further, what happens when I hit it? As I was striking the finger and as I was walking around on it, a unexpected sound is occurring. The sound of wood. In fact, when I hit the finger, the chips that come off are not fleshy at all. When we look at the scarring where the flesh has been peeled away, there isn't like that muscle or sinew underneath at all. This just looks like wood, like carved wood into the shape of two fingers. Moritz suggests that these fingers could be used from the roots of the Erd tree as remote control through the greater will. We know they work as envoys. We know that people decipher their messages so that the greater will and its plan can be imparted upon the land. Could it be that the fingers are actually not made of flesh at all and they are merely puppets made from wood carved out to serve as antenna for the greater will to push its influence around the lands between? That is the theory of Moritz and I really, really like it. But when we return to the round table hold again, and we once again look at the one that was speaking to us, this is different. This has the imprints of a palm. These wounds look real to me, and that looks like flesh stripped away. When we consider, say, the free fingers, they too move in a more muscular and, well, hand way. Even if it's lit by fire, it seems more fleshy. Finally, when we come to the two fingers that we help Rani kill in her storyline, these are much more physical and alive. They have a sort of gray or deep blue color to it. And let's be honest, that ain't wood. That is very clearly flesh that has been hewed by what happens with uh, Rani. My theory then to further follow on from Moritz's is that there is indeed two types of fingers after all. There are the real ones, the living flesh ones, and there are the wooden ones that you can find at the top of the towers, which work as kind of antenna at the top of those towers to pick up the signal, as it were, of the greater will. It's a really cool theory though, and one that I've never really stopped to look at and think about and well worth including in this series. So let me know what you guys think about this. Thank you very much, Moritz. Really, really interesting. Next up, a pretty useful tip. This one again comes from the comments from Apex Hydra. They tell us that they experience something here. Here you have some invisible enemies, magicians and such that attack you. It's quite an annoying experience. Here you go. So one's just appeared out of nowhere and it's attacking me with those ranged attacks. There are other places where annoying ghosts and invisible enemies can be found, like Ordina here in the inner consecrated snowfield. And the thing is, apparently you can summon here, right? As you can see by the icon. So let's just summon in my mimic. Apex Hydra tells us summons can detect enemies and attack them 
even if they're invisible. So you don't need to worry about invisible enemies quite as much. By having an active summon with you, it's able to find them and take them out even if they're currently inactive, not in combat or invisible. As you can see, it's just spotted that one and it's killing it before it can do anything. Specifically though, he referenced this summon right here, Engval, who would actively seek out the invisible enemies, making for a pretty good summon for targeting them and interrupting them, although mine is obviously plus zero, so not exactly strong right now. But it's good to know that they're able to kind of break the AI in a way that is really beneficial to us. We might not be able to see that invisible enemy over there, but Engval or your summons in general can. It's invisible to me and he is actively fighting and striking that enemy as a great example of how this works. So yes, thank you very much for this tip Apex. Very important in certain areas where you're dealing with invisible enemies for sure. Moving on, our next tip or detail is from the comments from Slow Ocean, talking about crafting and the benefits of storage. Now, to me, this is a tip that makes sense, but for newer players, or if you've never really considered this, this can be really beneficial because it serves multiple purposes. It's to do with crafting in general, but also applies to any consumable in the games prior or, of course, Elden Ring. There is a limit to how many you can actually carry. If you were to go over that limit, say I I'm holding 99 arrows here, the rest will be going into my storage, which caps out at 600 arrows possible. You might find when you're trying to craft some pots or other items that you find beneficial that I can no longer craft more fire pots in this example because I'm currently holding the maximum amount of pots that I can hold, even though I have the resources to just keep crafting them. Slow Ocean reminds us that we can do something very simple but very beneficial. By going to sort chest in the menu, we can intentionally put away the fire pots I've just crafted all of them, and just like that, I'm going to be able to craft more pots, fire pots, or otherwise as I desire. But the most important detail here is this, auto refill. So if you have a build, say you're doing PvP, and there's certain consumables that you are using actively in PvP, throwing pots are obviously great in general, but most commonly seen are probably the throwing knives to finish off low health enemies, or the food that gives you physical resistance. You can craft the infinite amount that you want, and as soon as you reach the cap of current max holding, put them in your storage, and then by using the right stick, you can turn on autofill for this item. So as you can see, the icon has changed from filled in to empty, and then as I come out of the menu, it should now have refilled my stock, which yes, the firebots have been put back into my inventory without me intentionally doing it. This means whether you're crafting pots, bottles, arrows, or otherwise, before you get into a big PvP session, you can craft hundreds of them, turn on auto fill, and then not have to worry about them for an extended period of time. They'll never run out until you run out of the storage that you have. It's a good tip and a quality of life thing to do for sure. Next up, we have another interesting mystery. Now, the giants of the world and the war that happened with them. This is semi-documented law that is talked about in-game and we're able to discuss and talk about. There's things referenced to them all over the place, right? And obviously we fight smaller trolls and such in our game, and we even fight a fire giant as well in this very same area. Just to my right, in fact, across that chain is the big area where we fight the last fire giant. The thing is, there's something much, much bigger than any of the biggest giants we see in game or see discussions about. Below me, as you can see, is an absolutely colossal skull, quite literally in the area just before the fire giant in the area where you cross the chains to it. That skull is absolutely colossal. Look at the size of it. Compared to like the literal giants, like the fire giant, it's massive. And in fact, this is something that Sekiro Doobie talked about recently on Twitter. A few weeks back, he showed this image comparing the size of the fire giant to these colossal creatures that you can find around the world. Sticking out the floor in unexpected places, you may have walked over one and not even realized. I mean, look at the size of it. To my understanding, there is no reference or law or explanation for these giant creatures. Could it be that the Lands Between was once a host to absolutely seismic creatures before maybe the land and the terrain was changed itself? Why are they just so staggeringly big? What's the reasoning or law or history behind that? Because I am completely unaware and people that I see talk about this are also unaware. So if you know anything, you've seen anything, please let me know. 
For our last thing, I return to a discussion we had in a previous episode, a couple back actually, that I've been meaning to get to because there were some fantastic theories in the comments in regards to it. I am referencing this interesting line that we listened to before where Melina actually acknowledges Bok and that storyline, how she is surprised by his behavior and asks the question, is this what it is to be born of a mother? Is this the behavior expected of someone who has a mother? I think he misses his mother. He wants someone to tell him he's beautiful. Does being born of a mother mean one behaves in such a manner? The origin of Melina is a huge, huge thing. I have a whole law video where I think that she is either the vessel or ultimately is the dusk-eyed queen or the glow-eyed queen. But there's also a lot of theories, I mean, simply to do with her name alone, that she could be the daughter of Marika, an unknown, unexpected daughter. Multiple people in the comments, such as Just Another YouTube Addict and Solstice, talk about the AI name for Melina, which in the files of the game, she is referred to by the devs as her, like, file name, Marika of Daughter, which is a bit of a strange ordering, isn't it? But what it clearly means is Daughter of Marika, aka Melina is the Daughter of Marika. Now, it's not exactly that hard or big of a stretch to think that. There's this whole thing where so many characters have their name reflect their origins, right? So Marika has two children with Radigan, and those two are, of course, Mikola and Melania. Radigan had children with Ranella, so their children are called Rani, Radan, and Rikard. Melina is a very intentional name, and that's why, you know, it was suggested that maybe she could be the child of Marika. Not to mention, she talks about trying to return to where she was born, which is the foot of the Erd tree. But it's just another YouTube addict that brought up a really interesting point to do with a specific material. So we have the butterflies, right? And they're used in really important crafting. So the nascent butterfly used in certain sleep things is tied to Mikula. Then we have the Aeonian butterfly tied to the goddess of rot, tied to Melania. But then there's this third butterfly it's never really given like an origin or purpose. And you know, actually, Melina is covered in burns. That's revealed when she's about to burn herself. Could this third butterfly actually be a representation of Marika's lesser known third child, the fire child, Melina? She even tells you that she is burned and bodiless. So I think it's entirely possible that Melina is the third child of Marika. And while I don't think that's exactly a new theory, I really like these additions that I've never considered, such as the butterflies. A great follow-up there to a small section of a previous video. Thank you so much, guys, for getting involved in that. But there you have it. Another Things episode down. That was actually my 29th episode. I never thought we'd make it that far. If not for you guys give me this sort of discussion and things to look into, I doubt we would have, so yeah, again, a big thank you for that. If you do have any suggestions, theories, or things you don't think most people know, then let us know in the comments. Even if you don't have anything to say yet, a lot of people do get involved by just liking the comments they want to see included in the series, so that can help a lot too. For now though, I've been Hollow, you've been you, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage Is, uh, goodbye